Now, June Mack wasn't some A-list or even B-list Hollywood star, but she was a beloved figure and a treasured personality in the underground Hollywood movie circuit. And with so many friends and admirers constantly lurking about, one has to wonder just who was bold enough to take June Mack out with multiple eyewitnesses around? Was it someone who had so much power that they didn't fear the law? Or was it someone who hated June so much that they didn't care about the repercussions? This is Ashley with Ashley Says So and I am back with another old Hollywood scandal video. Before we proceed, I need to say that the meat in this video is not my research. Now I did do some extra digging myself and I was able to fill in small details, but again, the bulk of this research came from a podcast called The Rialto Report. Now without further ado, let's go ahead and listen to the disclaimer and try to figure out just who killed June Mack. June Ladies and handsome men, I am not sure sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now let's get to it. June Cassandra Mincher, aka June Mack, was born in January 1955 as an eighth child to a dirt poor family who lived in Louisiana. Her childhood was rough because her parents were so poor that some nights they even failed to put dinner on the table. And because there was constant stress on her parents and because they were always struggling to stay afloat, they didn't really have much time to show much love and affection to their children. So June, along with some of her other siblings, felt left out and felt very alone and ignored. In fact, gossip claims that June herself felt very forgotten and she battled constantly with the feeling of wanting to escape. And so anytime she would visit a friend or a more fortunate family member, nine times out of 10, they would have a television. And June would just prop herself up in front of that television and watch it all day. She would be delighted to see Marilyn Monroe. She would giggle when she saw Betty Grable and she would howl when she saw Lauren Bacall. All of these ladies and more helped June with her feelings of inadequacy. When she looked at them, she would imagine her features, her facial features as looking like theirs. The furs, the diamonds, all of that, she imagined them to be her. And since June saw this so clearly, she felt like this was her future. And she made a vow that one day she would look and live just like these women in real life. And by the time June was a teenager, baby the gossip claims that she was halfway there. The folks say that June started to style her hair in very stylish, luxurious curls. She started wearing tons of lipstick and painting her face. And at first, I don't think really many people paid her much attention, but right around the age of 15 years old, June Cassandra Mincher started to grow some curves. Where people used to merely glance when she walked by, now they were breaking down in full-blown stairs. Used to be where nobody would have nothing to say. Now when June walked down the street, you were likely to hear something like, mm, 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 look at her. Baby, you know that's so-so's child, honey. They know they need to do something about her. Baby, she ain't got no business swinging them hips the way she do. But June had no time to pay attention to the naysayers and the gossipers because she was too busy basking in the newfound attention that she was getting from the young men. All of those wolf whistles and come here gal, let me show you something made June smile. And all of this attention and all of this newfound glamour gave uh, June the confidence that she needed where she felt like it was time for her to go to Hollywood. But in order to go to Hollywood, she needed some Hollywood money. So June ended up getting a job, gossip claims, as a waitress. And with June flashing a glorious smile and switching her curvaceous figure, she would easily get triple the amount of tips than anybody else. And while June may have settled for this good money and simply stacked her way up, there were certain male customers who told her, oh baby, these tips ain't nothing. You could get much more money than this. All you gotta do is let me stick my tip into your personal tip jar. And I don't know if June was hesitant at first, but baby, she got over it because gossip claims that she began to take several men and teenage boys to the back to do what she had to do. After doing this for a short period of time and basically stacking up a bankroll, June finally was able to go to Hollywood. 
And as soon as she got there, she snagged her a small apartment. She also snagged her a part-time job as a nurse. But June didn't come to Hollywood to be a doggone nurse and live in a small apartment. She came to Hollywood to be a star. But unfortunately for June, all of that confidence that she had about her looks in Louisiana did not transfer over to California, to Hollywood. She wanted to turn her face into the idols that she saw on TV. To do that, you had to have the money and a part-time nurse's job just wasn't gonna get it. And so June returned to what she knew. She learned the ways of how the girls did it in Tinseltown. This wasn't no come on Chuck, give me a buck, I'll take you around the truck and we can type stuff. These women up here were mainly called escorts and they advertised their services professionally. Just like if you were flipping through a magazine and you were looking at a washer and dryer. So June learned the trade and she ended up running her own ad in an underground newspaper. And the ad quoted that June was sexy black and Indian. Had her measurements at 56, 26, and 42. She listed her location as a private apartment and she had a slogan that read, come worship my body. And with those measurements on this doggone call to action, baby, it was not long before June had multiple men lined up to be clientele. She was on a god dang on roll because she was new to Hollywood. They'd seen those other girls about 10 times already. And she also didn't get tired, baby, so there was a whole bunch of hunching and passing. And before long, June was able to save up $20,000, all of which she dropped on surgery. And baby, the folks say that June walked into that doggone doctor's office and told them to turn her into somebody else. Some of her friends even quoted that when June walked out of that doctor's office and she ended up pulling off all of the healing tape and stuff like that, they didn't even recognize her. Turns out when June was a little girl, she had become enamored by the diamond shaped Hollywood starlet's faces that she saw on her TV screen. And so she had these doctors just pump loads of silly cone in her face, mainly in her cheeks. She also had them shaved down her nose until it came to a cute little point and she had her chin shaved almost into oblivion trying to match her nose. And then she told them to take that silicone needle and pump a lot of it into her hip. And after she was done with her face and her hips, she inserted implants that made her boobs 66 inches. A lot of June's friends were absolutely horrified at what she had done to herself, but June felt like it looked good. When she looked in the mirror, she saw the stars from the old day. And so as soon as she healed, she put herself out on the Hollywood circuit. She was constantly looking for agents, uh, management, asking around about a casting director, trying to get studios to call her back. But what she ended up finding out was that nobody was interested. And while those men weren't interested in hiring her for a movie, they certainly were interested in hiring her for the night. Without even meaning to, June Mack had turned herself into a fetish. And I'm talking about she was a favorite among white collar, high rolling white men. Executives, CEOs, CFOs, studio heads, maybe even a low level politician here or there. And they expected top performances for their money. And I ain't talking about no regular go in deep and throat bolt type stuff. Because see, they'd had that a hundred times. They were used to that. They could get that anywhere, mainly from their actresses that they had on set. So in order to please these men, June had to learn all the tricks of the trade. And she did it and gossip claims she was good at it. The folks say that this girl had a lavender Rolls Royce. She had a Mercedes Benz and she ended up having a convertible sports like low rider type car. The folks say that she wouldn't leave the house without $12,000 in cash. Says she used to roll it up and keep it up under her weed. As much as June was making money and living though, she still wanted to become an actress. And with June having this high powered clientele constantly coming in and out of her life, it wasn't long before she found out that all of Hollywood was not the same. Yes, you have one Hollywood that's all business like and A-list, B-list actors, but then you have another side of Hollywood that also made movies. But these movies were much seedier and much dirtier. Somebody put a word in with the director by the name of Russ Meyer. Russ Meyer ended up grabbing a copy of one of June's 
underground newspaper ads and he liked what he saw. He sent his screenwriter, Roger Ebert, to go talk to June and see if she had what it took to be in his movie. And it was called Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. And gossip claims that Roger Ebert went right over there to June and got his hair blue back because he asked June, what did she feel like she had to offer to this movie? And June told him the experience that she had and what she did on the daily. And rumor has it that whatever she said made Roger Ebert turn tomato paste red. And he told June, okay, we're probably gonna need you to do all of that, but you can hold off on all the shit and the piss you be doing. So that should kind of give you an idea of just what June was doing in the bedroom with a lot of those high powered men. To move on though, June was cast in Russ Meyer's movie and in this movie she portrayed a character by the name of Junkyard Sal and this role made June an underground star. You know, she was invited to underground award shows. She would speak at the podium. She was invited to high class underground parties and also underground functions with red carpet. And she no longer saw herself working with the big huge Hollywood studios but she did start to see herself uh, working with Andy Warhol and Mel Brooks and people like that. But unfortunately for June these people had no upcoming movies uh, that fit her and so to pass the time she started posing in dirty magazines. There also may have been a couple of prono movies she was in because you know I can't say the real word but when nothing more happened and all of these things dried up she went right back into her escort service. But after a couple of years, even this came to an end. You know, she was no longer that fresh new face in Hollywood that all the men were gunning for. Not only that, she had picked up more weight, started to get some blemishes and wrinkles on that perfect skin. And it wasn't a lot. She didn't turn into a gruesome looking woman or anything like that. She just started to age. And so her clientele started dropping down bit by bit because the novelty of laying down with Big June Mac had lost its novelty. Eventually, June had mostly closed down her escort service. You know, she still had a few regulars that would come around, but she didn't move back home to Louisiana because she had a life now in Hollywood. So what she settled for was doing phone sex. And she found out that when you do phone sex, you can quite literally change yourself to another person because the person on the other side of the phone will never be able to see who they're talking to. And so she takes out another underground ad. And on this particular ad, she describes herself as a sexy goddess with long black hair and a pretty face. And Gossip claims that she also adds a photo of herself, but this photo is from years before when she was still in better shape, when she still had flawless skin, and when she still had those long curly wigs. And it was this ad that attracted a guy by the name of Greg Cavalli. And Gossip claims that Greg Cavalli was a part of a family that was loaded with money. And Greg himself was said to be very spoiled. You know, he always wanted to get his way, never knew how to work for his money he would cause confusion a problem child a person crazy person pretty much well anyways Greg Cavalli calls the number on June's ad and June tells him that her name is Pam Rogers and Pam Rogers aka June sweet talked Greg's ego hard well Greg falls in love baby gossip claims that he calls June aka Pam every single day talks to her about two to three hours a day for four months straight. And by the end of this four months, he is telling Pam, AKA June, that he is in love with her. You know, he wants to marry her. And allegedly without telling her, he gets one of his high powered friends to trace her phone number back to her address. And he starts sending her pictures of himself. He even sends a couple of love letters. And Pam, AKA June, plays this off. You know, she's like, oh, I got your pictures. You know, you are so handsome. But then Greg starts to say, well, now now I want to see you. You know, now I feel like we need to meet in person. And this is when June, aka Pam, knew uh, this is going too far. So she tries to start kind of distancing herself from Greg. You know, she doesn't take his calls as much. And when she does take his calls, you know, she tells him, I got something else I got to do. I'm a little busy today. 
Well, Greg just starts to get more and more adamant. You know, you need to talk to me. And by the way, when can I see you? I need to see you. I love you. Well, baby, one day Greg shows up, knocks on the door, calling and asking for Pam and saying, you know, this is Greg. Hey, Pam, open the door. It's Greg. I, I found you. I want to see you. June is terrified. So she does not come to the door. Greg burst in the door, walked back to the bedroom, burst in the bedroom door, and in front of him was not Pam Rogers, baby, it was June Matt. And June looked nothing like those pictures she had put in that ad, those pictures she had taken so many years back. Baby, the folks say June was standing there 250 pounds. She had no makeup on whatsoever to cover any blemishes. And probably the thing that shocked Greg the most, and probably the thing that shocked Greg the most, June was in her natural. She didn't have a wig on or anything like that. So she just kind of had a low cut, you know, them low cut natural style. Well, Greg is like, you know, who are you and where's Pam? And before June can even explain the situation, he lashes out and busts her upside the head and also slaps her in her face about three times. Telling her that she's a liar and she tricked him. You know, you said that you had long slits legs. I'm looking at you. You don't look all good. Where's your hair? You don't look like the woman in the picture. As a matter of fact, you look like a freak. After he's done putting the hands on her, he basically points to her and he tells her, you know, you never contact me again. Don't you ever call me anymore. And then he walks out. Gossip claims that June contemplated calling the police, but then she talked to a couple of friends and also she thought about it herself. You know, she basically was a sex worker. Also, she was a black woman. You know, she just didn't think that things would work out for her so she figured you know okay that happened that was crazy this man has hit on me but it's done it's over with I don't have to worry about Greg Cavalli anymore but she did have to worry about Greg Cavalli much more than she thought she did because you see Greg had fallen in love. And even if he was not in love with June, he was in love with Pam, the persona that she had created. And so he began to call June's phone again and would make himself upset every time Pam did not pick up the phone. Like every time June answered her phone, he would say things like, you know, you stupid B, didn't I tell you to leave me alone? Leave me alone, never bother me again. And baby would call and do this multiple times a day. It got to the point where where June just stopped answering the phone for this crazy man. He would start to leave voicemail. I'm gonna make your life miserable. You're nothing but a fake, a phony. I can't believe you play with me like that. Sir, you were calling a phone sex line, a sex worker, what is wrong with you? Now June tried to just ignore her situation and just deal with it the best she could. But the more that Greg continued to call her phone, it started to irritate her. If you don't want me, leave me alone. I am not Pam Rogers. You know what I'm saying? You have found out the truth. Leave me alone. And now you probably want me, the real June, but I don't want you because you've done too much. So leave me alone. But Greg Cavalli would not leave her alone. And so June, along with her friends, you know, talking and giggling, comes up with her own plan. And so she ends up bombarding Greg with phone calls. But not only Greg, she calls his grandmother and leaves voicemails on that machine. Uh, she calls his father. She calls some of their places of business. Like she really tries to get him back so he could just leave her alone. But this probably was the worst thing that June Mack could have done. Soon after she made these phone calls, which all of this happened in the year 1983 I'm sorry I don't know if I gave you guys a timeline but this happened in 1983 soon after June made these phone calls uh Greg Cavalli's car mysteriously got firebombed and he blamed June police came to her apartment they arrested her but they ended up having to let her go because they didn't have sufficient evidence then in February 1984, Greg Cavalli's father's surplus military store ended up being torched. After it happens, Greg is the first one telling his father and everybody else that you remember that lady that left the voicemails on your phone? You know, June, she did it. She's been terrorizing me. She burnt your store down. And there were several more things that happened to the Cavalli family. You know, sometimes their uh, house windows would be broken, you know, or their tires would be on flat or something like that and every time Greg blamed it on June and he would send the police and she was arrested multiple times. One of those times that she got arrested, she was made to stay in jail overnight 
And a lot of the officers came and kind of banged her up, kind of beat her up. And allegedly it was because they were paid by Greg Cavalli's family. You know, once again, I told you this guy came from a wealthy family. All of this is alleged, but yeah. Still though, things just went from bad to worse. Greg ended up leaving California altogether and he moved to Phoenix and he said he had to because June was just that crazy. You know, he was scared of her and what she might do to him. However, records showed later on that when Greg got to Phoenix, a lot of the phone calls he made while he was in Phoenix were to June's apartment. And I don't really know what June could have done that was so bad for Greg to behave the way that he was behaving, but it soon came down to levels of the straight danger zone. And that is when word started sweeping through the dark Hollywood streets that Greg Cavalli was looking for bodyguards. He needed somebody to protect him from this maniacal, crazed, black trans prostitute that had been harassing him. And nowhere in June's history that I saw, her real history, has it ever said that she was trans. You know, a lot of people even today allegedly make the mistake of thinking June was trans, but from what I saw, she was a full woman. So the fact that Greg tried to throw in that she was trans in there, he tried to raise the uh, height of danger level for himself. You know what I'm saying? Basically tried to say, you know, this ain't no full blown woman. This this is a man coming after me. And since Greg is wealthy and runs in high powered circles, it is not long before he's connected to Larry Flint, the owner of Hustler Magazine. And Larry or one of Larry's associates basically tells Greg, hey, I got somebody you can hire. This guy's name is Bill Mentor and he will do whatever he needs to do to protect you. And Gossip claims that it was actually Greg's father who paid Bill Mentor $200,000 to be protection for his son. And it was not even two weeks later after the Cavalli family hired Bill Mentor that uh, June was sitting at home entertaining one of her regular clients from way back when, when a group of well-built thugs, by the way she described them, kicked down her door. They rushed to her back bedroom, pulled her off of her client, threw her down on the floor and started to pistol whip her. Not only did they pistol whip her, baby, they pistol whipped her client and then they left. Well, now June is absolutely terrified. She don't know if Greg sent these people or if this is a whole nother uh, group of people that just did her like this. You know, I'm pretty sure her instincts told her these people were with Greg Cavalli, but it's just that she had no concrete proof. She didn't know what was going on. All that she knew was that her life was falling apart and she had no help for real. All that June could do was surround herself with people that cared about her. And so she was constantly either with a group of friends or one or two friends, constantly with somebody. But even that, did not help June Mack. On May 3rd, 1984, June is with a guy by the name of Christian Pierce. And they are in Van Nuys, California, and it is 1030 at night. I think they may have come from a party. So they're walking down a street called Sepulveda Boulevard, and they are talking, chatting, and laughing. When they pass a car sitting on the side of the road with tinted windows and a man sitting in front of the car kind of leaning back on the hood. Gossip claims as soon as they walked past the man, he said something and June turned around to look. As soon as she did, her friend Christian later told police that he saw June break out in a panic all over her face and then she bolts, baby. She just takes off running. When Christian sees June take off, clearly afraid of this man, he turns around and he asks the guy, hey, what do you want? What's, what's going on? And ka -blammo. Christian is shot in the stomach and the guy walks up towards Christian with his gun, but he does not point it at Christian. Instead, he points it on down the street at June and more shots ring out. June is hit from behind and she collapses in the middle of the street and the gunman walks calmly over to her and he empties the clip. After he's done, he kicks June a couple of times, then he goes back to Christian and he also kicks Christian and then he gets back in the car and whoever the driver
driver was in that car because allegedly the shooter was the passenger, uh, they take off driving down the street. Everybody who was in the party or the get together that June and Christian had just left heard the gunshots. So they run outside and they find Christian and June and so they end up calling the police. When the police get there, they find Christian shot in the stomach but he is alive. But when they go to June, they see that she's been shot in the head, she's been shot in the face, she's been shot in the back and she's been shot in the chest and she is deceased. Rumor has it that the cops who started investigating the case basically tried to say, you know, that it was obvious that June was living some sort of underground uh, lifestyle. You know, they went back to her apartment, they saw the handcuffs, they saw all of the stuff that she used to use when she was doing her escort. And not only that, because the guy June was with, Christian Pierce was a gay man, they assumed that June was a transsexual they also said with June's dealings with high powered men, you know, it possibly was an anonymous hitman, you know, somebody hired as a contract gun. Well, Christian Pierce had something to say about that. Rumor has it that when he woke up in the hospital, he told the police, no, it wasn't no anonymous nothing. I saw June with fear in her eyes when she looked at that guy and she took off running. This was somebody she knew, somebody she feared. And so once they started correcting the details and stopped making stuff up in their own heads, that's when they marked that June was a woman. You know, she was a black woman. She was 29 years old and she was deceased. They also marked that she most likely knew who her killer was and so they really started to do real investigation type work. You know, they started talking to her friends, trying to see what was going on, and soon the name of Greg Cavalli came up. Once they started digging into Greg Cavalli, they found out a whole slew of things, even found out that some of those things that June had been through while she had been uh, terrorized had been financed not only by Greg's father, uh, had been financed by his grandmother. And the grandmother was a woman who had been looked at as a pillar of the community. You know, she had owned an investment firm and you know had donated to multiple things and here they were finding out that this woman had done some dirty things to try to help her grandson Greg to get away from this black prostitute June Mack. And I will leave the link where I got all of this information in the top comment so you guys can read all of the details for yourself. But basically after they did a thorough investigation, it took probably about one to two years, uh, they finally had enough evidence where they would charge Greg Cavalli. You know, they found out about the bodyguard Bill Mincer. They found out everything they needed and he went to trial. And the prosecutor was not playing any games with Greg Cavalli. They painted him as like a jilted lover and a man who had become obsessed with a woman who did not want him. But the defense had something even better than that. June's character. You see, this was 1985 and back then judging people on their character was a serious problem. So when the defense got up there and they started throwing things out about June's sex life and how she'd mess with all of these high powered men, you know, look at how she changed her whole body. Look at all of these underground ads, these dirty magazines. Look at this movie she was in. You see what type of person she was. They ended up flipping the script from Greg being jilted and obsessed to June being jilted and obsessed. You know, this was a sex worker who fell in love with one of her clients. You know, she locked her claws into him and she decided that if she couldn't have him, nobody else could, you know, so she firebombed his place. She terrorized him. And as Greg could see the tide turning, you know, some of these people's opinions shifting to his favor, he even got up on the stand. He told them that calling June on that phone for the first time was the worst mistake of his life. He he said that when he actually saw her in person, he was repulsed by her. He said that he was disappointed and that he rejected her sexual advances. He didn't want her at all. But even after saying all this, gossip claims that there was evidence to which Greg had to admit that there was a second time that he'd made his way to meet up with June. It probably wasn't in her apartment, but he had clearly known that she was going to be somewhere and he made his way to be where she was. So how repulsed could you have been, sir? What you have to do, check in a second time by showing up to a place this lady was at just to make sure you wasn't attracted to her? Like, come on, man. Either way it goes, it turned into a whole bunch of he said, she said, but of course, June was not physically there to say anything. 
And a lot of people that they put on the stand to defend June were people a lot like her. They were living in an underground life. You know, they put a lot of gay people on the stand. They even had a real transgendered uh, prostitute on the stand. So these people, you know, they were just like her. Once again, society just did not look at these people like they could be honest and upstanding people. And so on June 19th, 1986, Greg Cavalli was found not guilty. And tell me down in the comments, what do you think? Since Greg Cavalli was judged to not have been June Max killer, then who killed June? You know, what do you think? And I also want to tell you guys, watch out. You know, a lot of times we will go through great lengths and move to different places to chase our dreams, which I'm not telling you not to, but just watch out because sometimes you can come into contact with people who are just sent here to destroy. They will destroy any and everybody. And if you end up in their circle, they just might destroy you. So if you guys like this video, go ahead and press the like button and actually like this doggone video. Also, if you guys are new here and you want to subscribe, just hit the subscribe button and also click subscribe to all so you can get all of the videos that I do. And if you guys have just been sitting on the fence, just watching my videos, just a laugh and a cry or whatever y'all been doing, stop being messy like I always tell y'all. Go ahead and click the subscribe button. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So and I will be back with another video soon. Bye.